that where, was, where does their stop? Do you remember when, when the judge asked Ernie about the where does the defendant stand on um, the laws uh, in the Constitution, et cetera? Because it was almost like an emperor has no clothes moment where she was asking this because – Ernie, you, your response was great. You said, well, he goes straight to the Constitution. He believes the Constitution is the law of right. the land. But as for – and then she she drove this question. She said, well, what about the current – what about the current laws? Yeah, and, and I told and, her, she got, she, you got to apply the statute, the code, and the regulations. But, but that was a big deal all, for her. Yeah, it, well, and she smiled about that the whole time she was looking at me. She grinned from ear to ear because I said, you have to apply those. But those are lower laws. There's a higher law. It's the U.S. Constitution, yeah. the common law. And I noticed the grin on her face, like, okay, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like, I don't know if she meant I shouldn't ask that question. Or it kind she, of is the question. She was kind of agreeing with it. I don't know. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if there's any connection at all in any of this, but I just got word a few minutes ago that the Pamela C. Marsh, the U.S. attorney, that her name's on all kinds of stuff in my original case and the last one, has resigned yesterday. And uh, so that's what uh, uh, Theodore told me. Huh. So there'll be stuff on his freekenthoven.com site about that. And I heard that Michelle Heldermeyer, who came after me at the original case in 06, uh, has, is now pretty serious cancer in uh, in Colorado. I, I hate that. I, I don't want you to shut on anybody. You know? And, uh, of course, the one, uh, John David Roy Atchison, pr- uh, pedophile, went to Detroit to have sex with a five-year-old and got off the plane and hung himself. And uh, federal courthouse is down with you know mold, and they say it's going to cost it costs $10, billion, $10 million to build it and $30 million to fix it for a month. I don't know if there's any connection or not, and don't accuse me of saying that, but I think somebody ought to say, hello, maybe, maybe God's trying to talk to somebody. I don't know. I just want him to leave me alone, okay? <laughs> I'm just a preacher who wants to get out and serve God. We'll, so. we'll recognize it as the wrath comes down on our nation as a whole, and then it's it may be too late for the American American believers, and I redefine Christian to believers, because yeah. you got to be a believer, and if, if uh, you, you're defining yourself as a Christian and you don't know what a believer is, then you need to need to get into God's Word and find That's out. That's a good point. I love mm-hmm. that. Thank you so much, fellas, for joining us, and uh, we'll do more of your questions here as soon as I can. We're getting to it. Thank you so much. And it's not Rudy that you have to be scared of. And it's not Mr. Ernie Land that you have to be scared of. It's the wrath of God Almighty. God Almighty is going to see that you pay. And we've got an embargo on mainstream press. And Ken Hoban can't get on mainstream press. And uh, <laughs> and even 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 the hero of conspiracy theories, Alex Jones, don't want to touch him. <laughs> don't talk about Rebecca Horton, who wanted the land and turned you in for 30 pieces of silver and filthy lucre. If I have to spend the rest of my life and everything, all of my treasure, Judge Margaret Casey Rogers, Pamela C. Marsh, and Tiffany Hope Eggers, you're going to get what's coming. If I have to spend the rest of my life, you will get what's coming. That man, this week, he spent two days in solitary. He slept on a mat on the floor in an overcrowded cell that was quarantined for scabies. They had to come in and disinfect his cell because he had scabies in the cell. He was sleeping on the floor on a mat. He can't even have a Christian company because people are fighting around him all the time. When he speaks to me on the phone, he has to kneel down on one knee because only one of the three phones in a cell of 43 prisoners has a chair.
It's everything I can do not to lose my temper. It's everything I can do not to lose my Christian testimony. But I will have you know, Judge Margaret Casey Rogers and Pamela C. Marsh and Tiffany Hope Eggers and Rebecca Horton and Michelle M. Heldemeyer, you are five Jezebels of the highest degree. And if I have to spend every single penny I got, and if I have to spend every ounce of energy I got from the time I wake up till the time I go to bed, justice, justice, judgment, justice is coming. And it's not Rudy that you have to be a scared of. And it's not Mr. Ernie Land that you have to be a scared of. It's the wrath of God Almighty. God Almighty is going to see that you pay for what you have done to that man who has spent eight years in hell surrounded by the lowest base of humanity. Cursing all the time and fighting all the time. The injustices that you have done will come to the light. And I know that there are men and women in the body of Christ that will not stand for it anymore. And the best thing you can do at this point in time is to repent for your sins and ask God Almighty to forgive you. And that's the very best thing that you can do. But even if you do that, there, are, there will be consequences for what you have done to the body of Christ. And you have stolen, you have stolen a leading light of biblical truth that was promoting biblical truth to America and to the world. But what you have meant for evil, God will use for good. You have no idea what you're messing with. The judgment of God is going to come against you, girls. You have gotten in over your head. You have exposed this evil system. The best thing that you can do is to repent of your sins and to acknowledge that you have done wrong to Kit Hovind, and come Friday, you best let him go. You best let him go to his family so that we can get on with our lives, and I would suggest you make a public apology and repent and just suffer whatever consequences come at you in this earthly life. And that will save your eternal soul. But justice is coming, girls. Justice is coming. To every single one of you for what you've done and people will find out I guarantee you it's going to happen all right so I'm going to be gone for a while and I believe in making every video as if it's my uh, last video and so I don't want to hold anything back I don't want to worry if it upsets anybody I don't want to worry if it ruins my credibility <laughs> Um, I just want to share with you my thoughts over the last two weeks. And um, if they're going to try to throw me off the ship, my attitude is I'm going to take a couple of crew members with me. Um, so these last two weeks uh, attending the Ken Hovind trial has been an experience that I wouldn't trade for the world. I have met some good, godly men and women, soldiers in the army of the Lord, uh, people who understand what's going on and are not afraid to stand on the truth, to stand up for our brother Ken Hovind, and um, they don't care about ridicule, they don't care about um, you know peer pressure, they're not afraid of the government, they're not afraid of the IRS. So. It was quite an experience to meet these people, and I think heaven is going to be a wonderful, wonderful place when it starts to be populated with uh, these men and women.
There was a few that I talked to that said Ken Hoven should be contrite. Maybe he should be humble, more humble, apologize to the judge. Maybe she'll go le a more linear sentence on him. And I would ask those people that put forth that idea, well, would you have walked up to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, if you just bow the knee a little bit when you hear the music played, maybe the king won't be so mad at you? Would that have been your advice to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Ken Hovind is not a prideful man. Uh, that, that's what some people have a hard time seeing. And he's just a man of constitution, a man of character, and a man of principle, a biblical principle. And he's not going to bow the knee to Baal, no matter what. And if we had more men in this country like Pastor Ken Hovind, we wouldn't be in the shape that it's in. But I believe that Pastor Ken Hovind is a gift of God to the body of Christ, and that it's not Pastor Ken Hovind's responsibility to get out of prison. It's our responsibility as the body of Christ to stand up and demand that they release him. Demand that they release him. It's our responsibility. It's not Ken Hovind's. It's not his fault he's in prison. He hasn't done anything wrong. The body of Christ is the one that's been negligent. You know, oftentimes we hear about they are coming against our brother Ken Hoven. Well, over the last two weeks, I got to see who they are. And I want to talk about they. First of all, we have to ask ourselves, what, where was Pamela C. Marsh, the Georgetown Jesuit University Magna Cum Laude U.S. Attorney. Why didn't she show up? Do you think she had a conviction of conscience? Do you think maybe she looked at the situation and said, I don't want any part of this. You got to ask yourself, why didn't she show up? Let's talk about Tiffany Hope Eggers. Hey, Tiffany. Hey, before I came down to the trial, I looked all over the internet for your picture. I couldn't find your picture anywhere. And now that I have seen you, girl, I can understand why you don't want your picture to get out. I really can. My goodness. The Lord has cursed you with a face that matches your heart perfectly. You understand what I'm saying? You could take a little green paint, Tiffany, and you could smear that all over your face, and you would fit in perfectly with the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz. My goodness. My goodness. Um... Your face matches your ugly heart perfectly, girl. You are something else. And you getting up and you're closing arguments and uh, calling Kent Hovind greedy, that everything that Kent Hovind does is motivated by greed. Is it greedy to try to recover the land that the government illegally stole from him? <laughs> is it greedy to try to get that back because the government has no right to it? because they misapplied structuring laws to a law-abiding citizen, and you wouldn't even let the IRS apology uh, get introduced into the courtroom? You are one ugly Jezebel witch, and you look like a witch. When you turned around, I thought, my goodness, are we in Halloween or what? Tiffany, what you did this week will go down in judgment. All the lies you said and you getting excited about Ken Hoven saying the word dog crap, and when you put the presentation up in front of the jury, uh, you put dog with a long line, like trying to make it imply that he said dog, S-H-I-T, instead of dog crap. What's so bad about saying dog crap anyway? And you're, you got, you seem to get excited every time you play a voicemail, a private conversation between Ken Hoven and his son, and oh, they don't necessarily agree on something, or Ken Hovind was trying to discuss some part of the case, why don't you, you know, if you get to play all of those voicemails and emails and letters, all the stuff that you, you know, you just look over Ken Hovind's shoulder all the time, why don't you, why don't the defense get a chance to play when Ken Hovind's talking about the Bible or talking about winning souls to the Lord, but you only, you take eight years of, documented phone calls and letters and everything else you guys monitor 
and you just cherry pick what you consider is appropriate for the jury to hear? Well, how come, how come the defense can't cherry pick and play like who Kent Hovind, uh, what he spends most of his time doing, which is talking about the Bible and winning souls and things like that. But see, th that courtroom is not a courtroom of justice. It's a wicked, satanic, Jezebel-controlled courtroom is what it is. And you and Margaret Casey Rogers, I guarantee you, y'all are in some sort of cahoots, man. You could just sense the vibes going on. But let me say this, Tiffany. Uh, judgment day is coming. Your, your judgment day is coming. And you, it's not they and them and the government. It's you, Tiffany Hope Eggers. And uh, you were on the first prosecuting team and you're on the second one and you must be very proud of yourself and you're bouncing all over that courtroom and running up to the witness stand and you're telling your little twerpy friend Scott Snyder to read paragraph five and read paragraph two and read this document you know look at this letter that he mailed we've got fingerprints aha <laughs> his name was on the document I don't think that fingerprints is all that big a deal Oh, Tiffany, man, I tell you, there are those that are praying that your soul will get saved. I, I've, uh, I've heard him mention that. Based on my experience and seeing you in action and knowing that what you just did over the past two weeks and what you did eight years ago, man, I don't know if there's any hope for you or not. They say God can forgive you no matter what. What is it, what is it in your mind that wants you to send this good godly man to prison because he don't recognize the fact that you you know he recognizes that you guys made a terrible mistake is what the problem is and you guys want to cover up your mistake because I guarantee you once your mistake becomes widely known and and listen to this your mistake will become widely known it already is it's gonna you're gonna you're gonna be like the most widely known popular US attorney on planet earth Right? Everybody's going to know U.S. Attorney Tiffany Hope Eggers. And you ain't going to be able to hide your picture in the paper anymore. The only thing and the best thing you can do is repent for what you've done to Pastor Ken Hovind and come out and ask for forgiveness. And that's the best thing that you can do at this point. But you keep going down this road, you're going to be the most popular U.S. Attorney in the most negative way you can possibly imagine. And people are going to get a chance to become real familiar with that face you've got that you're trying so hard to hide. Let's talk a little bit about uh, that little man, Scott Snyder. That little man who's saying, yes ma'am, every time Tiffany Hope Eggers barks an order, read this document, yes ma'am, <laughs> yes ma'am, yes ma'am. Scott Snyder, IRS special agent sitting at the prosecution table, gets to march on up to the witness stand and march on back, bring up another witness, and then you, bring, you, you get to testify after every witness. It's like, you're the, you're the star of the show. I don't think anybody testified as long as IRS Special Agent Scott Snyder. Hey, Scott, what are you going to do? You going to send me a bill from the IRS like you already did? You going to do your big bad threat? You know, like you're going to send me a letter in the mail? Is that your threat? A letter in the mail. <laughs> you going to audit me, Scott? You going to send an audit? Like you gonna, you gonna send me a bill for twenty five thousand dollars? Hey, you know what I'll do when you send me the audit? Because I'm, I'm anticipating a, a letter from your organization. I'm gonna hold up the letter and I'm gonna say you're gonna have to kill me to collect that money. And I hope they send you, Scott. I hope they send you on the SWAT team out to my house because you are a very small and little man who's come against Brother Ken Hovind. He is so far in stature above you, you wouldn't even be able. To, oh my goodness. And you think you're on the establishment winning team. And you priss around there like your little, behind your little Jezebel Tiffany Hope Eggers. And you've made it your life's mission to go after the big bad Kent Hovind. He's a danger to society. He might actually break loose from prison and win a few souls to the Lord. <laughs> but you've, because of your special knowledge and your special skills, and your special ability to go through 10,000 emails. You admitted on, on the witness stand that you could have gone through 10,000 emails. How many phone calls did you listen into, Scott? Do you ever feel like ashamed listening to other people's private phone conversations? Do you ever feel ashamed 
when you sequestered uh, Pastor Ken Hovind's family voicemail and, and their emails? Do you, ever, do you have any shame at all? When you wake up in the morning and you start going through other people's private communications, do you have any shame at all? You're a very little man, very small. And Judgment Day is going to reveal that. And just like I said to Tiffany, the best thing that you can do at this point in time is to repent for your sins and say, I'm terribly sorry. I was motivated by ambition. I was motivated by the establishment, which had me fooled. And uh, now I see the light and I'm going to drop persecuting Ken Hogan. And then the world would welcome you with open arms and say, you know, we're so glad that you repented of the sin that you've been committing for the past eight years. But it's very unlikely you'll do that. It's very unlikely you'll do that. And then you got that twerp who's like had too many biscuits to eat, J. Ryan Love, who didn't say anything. What are you like, some kind of dead weight on the prosecution team? I don't think you said one word the whole two weeks. You just sat there on the prosecution table like dead weight. Does Tiffany ever get mad at you? Because you ain't helping promote the evil, the evil wickedness in the courtroom? It's like, I would imagine like even the wicked people get mad at you. <laughs> you just sit there like a, do, do they let you like, <laughs> what did you do exactly? You know, what did you do for the prosecution? I mean, the Lord says that he would prefer that you be hot or cold. At least Scott Snyder and Tiffany are hot. They're like definitely far, far, far wicked. But J. Ron Love just sits there like he's ate too many biscuits. And, you know, and Tiffany will come over and ask him a question. He'll say, I don't have any question. <laughs> and then you have the numero uno head honcho, most evil person in the whole courtroom. Number one evil, wicked Jezebel witch. Oh, my goodness. She knows how to play both sides and put on the facade and fool everybody in the courtroom. And if you attended those last few days, oh my goodness, she's making an, an attempt to be fair. The one and only Judge Margaret Casey Rogers. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Judge Margaret Casey Rogers. See, I got a feeling that you're a little bit nervous. I got a feeling that based on what happened the past two weeks, you got a little bit of nervousness going on about right now. Because you expected him to get guilty on one of those mail fraud or conspiracy to get mail fraud charges. You expected him to get hit by at least one of them, and that would have given you the justification to give him another 10 years or 20 years. <laughs> but he... he he didn't get guilty on any of the mail fraud charges. He got guilty on a contempt of court order from six to eight years ago. Now everybody's watching you, Miss Judge Margaret Casey Rogers. Everybody's watching you. Are you going to be hard on the man? Are you going to be lenient? Do you think he's going to like beg you for leniency? <laughs> you are one evil, evil, wicked lady. The way you manipulated that jury selection and you did that psychological mind control and had everybody confessing their sins and you stressing the military service of not only the person you asked but their spouse. Man, you really, you really knew how to work the crowd. You can tell you've had a little bit of experience at this. But I tell you what, Judge Margaret Casey Rogers, <laughs> uh, you ain't going to get away with it. And just like Tiffany is going to be the most famous U.S. attorney in all of America, you're going to be the most famous federal court judge in all of America. Guaranteed. I heard there's a place where you can rate federal judges, and I, he I heard you've moved into the top 10 worst federal judges in all of America. Is that true? I heard that's the case. You're going to be number one worst by the time it's over with, I guarantee you. You guys think you're going to squash this, and people are trying to appeal... And like, you know, write you so that you'll be lenient. I ain't going to be lenient. Ken Hovind will do whatever Ken Hovind does, and I do pray that he gets out of prison. But uh, 
It ain't, it ain't going to be because we appeal to your mercy because you don't have any. I, I saw through you this last two weeks was a complete demonstration of who you are and you are one evil, evil lady. You're one of the most evil, wicked ladies that I've ever came in contact with. And you have no compassion for Ken Hovind, the fact that he's already spent eight years in prison, and uh, you, you, sh you have shown that. And the way that you manipulated this entire court, uh, and you tried to give the appearance of being fair, while at the same time biasing every single uh, situation against him. See, what, what you did to Ken Hovind is going to come back on you, and I guarantee it will. And you're going to be exposed. You and your Jezebel prosecutor, Tiffany Hope Eggers, and your twerp, little man IRS agent, Scott Snyder, and your dead weight, I've had too many potatoes for lunch, uh, J. Ryan Love. The only one who had any sense was Pamela C. Marsh, who at least had enough sense not to show up. What are you going to do um, when you start getting exposed for what you've done to Ken Hovind and you, people start realizing that you guys stole his property and misapplied structuring laws and you seized his property and you manipulated the jury uh, in such a way that they didn't have the full knowledge of the situation and they felt you know like they were trying to appease some sort of mind control crap that you pulled in that whole jury selection process. I remember when um, Judge Margaret Casey Rogers said something to the effect of the judgment of this federal court is the final judgment in perpetuity. <laughs> hey, hey, Judge Margaret Casey Rogers, do you think your judgment is the final judgment? Do you really think that? Because I don't think it's the final judgment, girlfriend. I don't think it's the final judgment whatsoever. You do have a lot of brethren out here. You know, the YouTube world, they're supporting you, man. And uh, we love you. Yeah. Um, this has been a difficult test. Yeah, truly. All right, brother. I'll, I'll stop recording now. If it, unless there's something else you want to say to everyone. No, just thank you so much for your support and prayers. What a blessing! It, 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 it is a, a great joy, but it also is a great burden to me to know that there are so many brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are in prison or are under constant threat of execution or who don't have anyone helping them, supporting them, praying for them. It's just, oh, I think I've been a Christian for 46 years, and I still am a wimp, and I still, you know, I feel the pressure of all this, and I, I, I need the support. What about those immature Christians, the brand new Christians, or those who don't have any support? Wow, I, I'm going to be a different man. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 25, we're supposed to visit those in prison and help those in prison, and I see that real clearly now why we should do that. I was able to lead two men to the Lord last night sitting at the uh, at the table. I uh, had a great time. Uh, and they've been coming to the Bible study. And finally, I just simply asked them, if you died right now, where would you go? Simple question. You don't ask them, you know, are you good or do you go to church? You know, are you going, where would you go? And they said, I don't know. I'm trying to do good. I said, oh, then that's really easy to answer. You're going to hell. Yeah. You're doing exactly what Cain did. Cain brought his works, his fruit. Hey, God, look what I'm doing for you. That's the shortcut to hell right there. Mm. It's what Jesus did for you, not what you can do for God. So that's a simple question to ask, and it's, it just never gets all of leading people to Christ. Wow. So I'll begin discipling them now, and uh, uh, what a joy. So thank you so much for those of you praying and supporting out there. Um, if you haven't led, led anybody to Christ, if nothing else, please, I hope my example in my prison time encourages 
thousands of others to do that, because that is all that's going to matter in 10,000 years. It is not going to matter what kind of car you drove or what kind of house you lived in, who did you introduce to Jesus. So please do that. All right. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Amen, Brother Kent. You know, it rejoices my heart to hear you say those things. And uh, that's true, brother. And there are many, many brethren, even in our own nation, you know, who are forgotten about and are just not loved, you know. So we must remember them, all of them. All right, brother, I'll stop this video. Uh, start your kids early. Uh, teach them the truth. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Thank uh uh, I'm a Christian, saved by grace. I've been having a hard time dealing with my sin. I don't feel very worthy of my Lord Jesus. Oh, Herb, I can't help you with that. I don't either, brother. I've been a Christian 46 years, and I'm still um, humbled by the fact that God would take me at all. So if your sin bothers you, good. It should. Mine does, too. You know, my wife has one of those little concave mirrors with uh, um, lights around it for putting makeup on. The closer you get, the more you see every you see every zit in your face when you get up there close to that thing. And the closer you get to the Lord, who's the light of the world, the more problems you're going to see in your own life. So getting closer to the Lord doesn't make you feel more proud. It makes you feel more embarrassed. Uh, and so I think most Christians will, will tell you that's been their experience. The more they read their Bible, the more they pray, the closer they actually get to the Lord the worse they feel about it. It's, I think it's a way to keep us uh, humble. You know, Cain tried to approach God with his works. God, look what I did for you. Here's my fruit, my vegetables I worked all hard all summer for. And God wouldn't accept it. And most religions are trying to approach God the way Cain did. God, look what I did for you. I did this, I did that. That's the Muslims. Look what I did. I, I blew myself up. I killed all these heathen. God's not going to accept that. It's not what you do for God. It's what Jesus did for you. So the closer you get to the Lord, that's a normal reaction, Herb. That's a good sign if you're feeling really, really unworthy. Because uh, you should. And I, I, I am. <laughs> Believe me. I don't feel worthy of my Lord. Praise God. I don't either. I'm not spreading the word like I should. Boy, Herb, me neither. Uh, I think I'm going to be embarrassed Judgment Day when God's going to say, Kent, here's what I gave you. Here's what you could have done, and here's what you did. Now, what happened? I don't know, Lord. I was lazy. I'm sorry. So, please, uh, forgive me. So, I think we should all, we're all going to be embarrassed on that day for not doing what we could have and should have done. He says, I don't feel like I'm a good representative of God. Me neither, Herb. Do the best you can and uh, keep, uh, serving, keep serving the Lord. Okay, uh, I didn't help at all, did it? Uh, sorry about that. Yes, I want to encourage you. That's a good sign. A good sign that you don't feel worthy. So, yay. And so we hope to get it out one of these days when my brother straightens up, if that ever happens. Anyway, hope that helps, folks. That's a general overview, the basic picture. What in the world is happening? God created the world. He owns it. He made it. It's his. He can make any rules he wants, and he made the rules. He said, do this, don't do this. He made those rules. He destroyed the world in that big flood in the days of Noah. It's his world. He can wreck it if he wants. And even in his judgment here, he remembered mercy and saved Noah and the family. Probably took him a hundred years to build that boat, and everybody in the world knew about crazy Noah building that thing, and anybody could have gotten on that boat. God provided a way through his judgment, the flood. And Jesus Christ is the only way to get through this coming judgment. If you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you've been forgiven, the judgment of God, the wrath of God will not fall on you. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 uh, and 5.9, we are not appointed unto wrath. We will get tribulation. And that's the only way I can make it all fit. So we'll get all that together in the book. But if you're listening to this program today and you're not sure you're going to heaven, what if you died today? I hope you don't, but you might. I might too. Where are you going? You're going to be dead for an extremely long time. I mean, you might want to pack for that trip. You know, you're going to be gone for a while. Where are you going? And this is where, February 9, 1969, my friend said, Kent, if you died today, where would you go? I said, I don't know. He said, well, have you ever sinned? Have you ever broken any of God's laws? Are you a sinner? I said, yeah. He said, well, then you're going to hell. I said, well, I don't want to go to hell. He said, well, he said, Jesus died on the cross. His blood will pay for your sin if you'll accept his payment. I said, I'd like that. 
And so by faith, I believed that Jesus died for me, rose from the dead, and he, Jesus, moved into my heart, in my life, February 9, 1969. It's like planting a seed. You plant a seed in the dirt. Uh, the dirt is 100% stupid. Dirt knows absolutely nothing. The seed knows how to make the tree. But the seed can't do its job unless the dirt will accept it. So you open up the dirt, drop the seed in, add a little water, and, you know, the tree grows. I'm the dirt. Jesus is the seed. I invited him in, and something started growing inside 46 years ago. Like, wow, what is going on in there? And he'll do the same for you. You just invite him to come in. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me and save me? And that simple act of faith, it wasn't the prayer that saves you. It's God's answer to the prayer that saves you. You can have a tape recorder pray a prayer. It's, it, does God answer the prayer is the secret. You just are the dirt. Say, Lord, I, I'm nothing. I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. I'm vile. Forgive me and save me. And his blood was put onto my account. And I'm forgiven. So when I stand before God at that great white throne judgment, he's going to open the books and say, Kent Hovind. And all the atheists are going to be, whoa, he's going to get his now. Now we're going to find out what that guy was really like. And the angel's going to say, book's clear, Lord, nothing here. Hovind, come on in. And the skeptics and scoffers and Hovind haters are going to what do you mean? I, he's a liar. He's a thief. He stole money. He didn't pay his taxes. They're going, to have their, <laughs> they're going to have their long list. Angel's going to say, shut up. I said the book's clear. Come in. My sins are gone. I mean, like, gone. And that's amazing. Uh, uh, Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4, Matthew 12, 34, 5, and 6 talk about every idle word that men shall speak. They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. God has a record of everything you've ever said, everything you ever thought, and everything you ever did. And if you don't want that record read out loud in front of everybody who ever lived, you better get on your knees and call out for Jesus to save you. That's the only way to get that record clean. Mine's gone. I'd love to stand next to you up there in heaven, and God says, calls your name, says, record clear, come on in. He will clear it out. It's wonderful. It's not that I've never sinned. It's that it's paid for by Jesus Christ. So this is kind of the big picture of history, and I thought about just turning my chalkboard around, having my regular charts, and doing a broadcast, because I have about 4,000 questions to answer that have been sent in. I said, well, the back side of these things... Uh, they showed on the other side, sticking out past my other chart. And I thought, well, somebody's going to say, what's that thing sticking out? That's what it is, my paper chart. We'll work on that later on. Please, if you've not accepted Christ, do so today. And let me know. I I'm sorry, I'm so far behind on emails and phone calls and all that. I'm trying, okay? But if you really, uh, if you want to leave a quick message, Hannah is such a blessing to me. She's just a young lady in uh, North Carolina that wants to help do volunteer secretarial work. Get a hold of her at SoBountifully at, at Mail.com. And tell her, hey, I got saved. I gave my heart to the Lord. That's the purpose of my ministry, my existence in life, is not to make money. It's not to get rich. It's to get people into the kingdom. Everything here is going to burn. Everything you work for all of your life is going to burn, too. Don't do that. Invest it in the heavenly kingdom. Hope that helps. Thank you so much. This one from a uh, Polish Catholic have some questions for you. Ooh, 15 questions. Okay, I'll hurry. Uh, quickly here. Uh, where can I find books about Islam and Catholicism and about Pope John Paul? Uh, I don't know. This is not my field of expertise. I think it is interesting. Someone sent me an article. Uh, where did I put that? Uh, uh, in my piling system here. The Bible clearly says, don't add to this book. Do not add to this book, okay? God's word is finished. And yet in the Koran, it refers to the Bible. So in this interesting article, I said, wait a minute now. How can the Koran be a holy book if it says the Bible's a holy book, but the Bible says don't add to this book? Isn't that self-contradictory? Wouldn't Muhammad be contradicting the, himself to say that he has a new revelation from God if God had said don't add to the book, and then he recommends the book that says don't add to this book? Interesting bit of logic there for someone to try to, to work on. I, I'll leave that for somebody else. i got other dragons to slay. Okay, number two. What do you think of Scott Hahn, H-A-H-N, and his arguments for Catholicism? I'm sorry, I don't know Scott or his arguments. Uh, I would be strongly uh, against many things that Catholics teach. I, I, could, I could support many things they teach, the virgin birth, etc. But uh, 
their, their method of salvation is purely a works religion, and many things they teach I would be very strongly against uh, as far as their doctrine. Not the people, just the doctrine. Uh, number three, do you think uh, Catholicism is the harlot from the apocalypse? I uh, don't know, possibly. Uh, that certainly has some of the, the, the earmarks of that. I'll tell you the guy you need to see on that topic would be David Daniels at uh, Chick.com. He has good stuff on that. Um, who else? There's many, many books on this topic. It's, uh, that's somebody else's dragon to slay. i got enough to do on evolution. Okay, number four. Why do you think the Catholics removed the second commandment? That's not true. Okay, now, I have said several times that the second commandment, don't make any idols, you know, graven images, in, the, in Exodus chapter 20. It's not removed from the Catholic Bible. Okay, I don't think I've ever said that. But if you get a little pamphlet from the Catholic Church, oftentimes they'll say, here are the Ten Commandments, or in little doctrinal booklets and stuff when they teach on this, and it will not have the second commandment. Instead, they split the, the Tenth Commandment into two. Uh, don't covet your neighbor's wife, and don't covet your neighbor's, you know, uh, property or something. So they do. So they do leave it out in their in their teaching and in their booklet because it is kind of embarrassing to have a commandment that says don't make a graven image when their church is full of graven images. So that's my take on that. That uh, uh, they do they do leave it out of uh, some of their articles and, and things that I've seen. Let's see. I uh, have a friend from. If you have a friend from Poland, please have him translate, and you give me a bunch of websites here. I can't do that, possibly. I only know about four Polish words, Yakshamatsha, that kind of stuff. Let's see, verse number five. Why do you think the Roman Catholic Church forbade and harmed people who translated the Bible from Latin? Uh, well, I think it's pretty well historical that they did. Anyone who would translate the Bible into the common language was really given a hard time, like Wycliffe and Tyndale and Martin Luther. And, I mean, there's a long list of people being really severely persecuted or killed for putting the Bible into the, what's called the common language or the, the, uh, the vernacular of the people. I think the reason would be quite obvious. The Catholic Church teaches some things that the Bible is against or does not support, and so they would uh, not want people reading their Bible because then they would quit being a Catholic. So I think that's, that, again, somebody else is dragging to slate. There are many good books on that. Where did I see? I think Chick.com has a whole series of books on, on Catholics and their, their teaching. There's... Uh, I spoke at a conference once with a guy who that was his full-time ministry, is ministering to Catholics. Uh, the wonderful people. It's, it's the doctrine that I'm against, not the people. It's what they teach. Uh, let's see, question six. Uh, a faked... This is probably a Polish person trying to speak English here. You Believe me, your English is much better than my Polish would be. Something... <coughs> Persons, because they faked Bible, like Luther and Hussite. Sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, what do you think of penalization of homosexuality, prostitution, and adultery, like the ban on mixed beaches, like in Singapore, or the ban on homo parades? What do you think of this quote, Romans 13? Um, well, certainly the Bible's pretty clear about adultery and fornication and homosexuality. I mean, it's real clear. Some countries, like Singapore, uh, enforce... Uh, um, some of their laws with uh, caning or beating, as you mentioned here. Uh, I think that's a lot cheaper than prison for, and a lot better for everybody involved. Uh, it gives, at least give the guy an option. If you're going to arrest somebody in America, give them the option. We're going to take a cane, we're going to whip you 20 times, or send you to prison for five years. They would all take the caning or the beating. Everybody would. I mean, five years. And it would save a whole bunch of money. And you don't have to say that's cruel and mean. Let the person decide. If you'd rather go to prison for five years, then go. But let them decide. Let them make that simple decision. Which one do you want? So I think there certainly needs to be uh, government has to enforce you know rules and regulations of some kind. What should what should the punishment be? Is really the question. Is it uh, uh, prison? Is so far the only string on the fiddle in America is prison, 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 and that string's out of tune. That needs to be shut down. 